In this video we talk about different types of sensors. The sensing principles are what we use to categorize them, electromagnetic, mechanical, chemical, detection mechanisms corresponding to them and working principles of these uh, sensors. So remember, by sensor we mean the transducer that converts um, a chemical or optical or mechanical or any other type of signal into an electrical one. So our categorization for the sensors that we talk about today and the ones that are commonly used in uh, lab on a chip. Electromagnetic is the largest group and under that we have optical, electrochemical, magnetic and thermal. We will talk about all of these. Mechanical, acoustic and uh, cantilever type sensors for sensing mass and chemical. Chemical we will not talk about. Uh, and based on whether the sample is labeled or not, we can have labeled and label-free samples. In the case of a labeled sample, you have the target molecule and onto this you need to bind a signal molecule of some sort, fluorescent marker or something with a high molecular weight that uh, a cantilever type sensor can pick up or a magnetic particle or something like that. That's a labeling where uh, there's a specific binding between the label and the target and you amplify the, the target. You can also amplify the signal to, to get a good readout or you do both. That's the next thing. So amplify the signal by doing this or amplify the target. Oh, sorry. Um, yes. So amplify the, amplify the signal by doing this and then do uh, electronic amplification or amplify the target by, uh, for instance, nucleic acid amplification or enrichment um, by evaporating, for instance, a liquid sample and uh, pre-concentrating the, the sample. That's the, the target amplification type. Purification is also something that you can consider as a target amplification. Purification of a sample to leave only the, the target in the highest quantity. That's a, a target amplification. Then based on the state of organism, your sensing scenario can be in vivo, so in living um, biological um, organisms in vitro, which is um, in, in uh, in a laboratory, you know, under laboratory, or artificial conditions, not uh, in a living um, organism. And then ex vivo, it would be also in vitro, but meaning that uh, you take it from living organisms. Uh, for instance, you take a, um, a sample, a stool sample, and then you run it in a cell culture. That would be ex vivo, but it is also in vitro, just to confuse you a bit more. Um, so first, spectrophotometry, and uh, what you have here is an optical cavity where there's an incident light and then a transmitted light. And here's your sample, sample being in our case uh, typically a liquid with, uh, with a molar attenuation coefficient, epsilon, and uh, a concentration of the chemical species that you want to detect. Remember, species can mean chemicals, microparticles, cells, etc. And um, length is the length of the optical path inside your optical cavity. And the Bert Lambert law is what helps us to quantify the concentration. So, absorption through this optical cavity is uh, proportional to attenuation coefficient times the length of the optical path and uh, the concentration of your uh, species. And these two are defined by your sample and uh, the setup that you measure with. So what remains is the concentration. And you can measure in absorbance mode where you look at the fraction of incoming and outgoing light or transmittance where you do the reverse. So what that means, you need to do some curve fitting. So you take the logarithm of uh, this fraction, 
for the absorbance spectrophotometry. And in the absorbance mode uh, for an optically transparent sample, what means what that means is incoming and or incoming and outgoing light intensity is the same. So sample is completely transparent. Then 100% is roughly what's transmitted and what's absorbed is roughly 0%. So not perfectly 100 and not perfectly 0, but close. And uh, opaque sample means that um, the transmitted in intensity goes towards 0. Transmittance is 0%, absorbance is 100%. So these are the limits between which we can work. And uh, transmittance is, uh, of course, the reciprocal of uh, absorbance. And here's a nice graph of uh, the detection of some biochemical and wavelength absorbance. So here's uh, two uh, variants of this uh, biochemical at, uh, at a different... Uh, uh, that uh, absorb at different wavelengths and at different uh, intensity. And this way you can get a spectrum of uh, what's inside your solution and then relate your spectra to the concentration of the various species that you have based on where they absorb. But in the case of uh, fluorometry, for instance, which is a, a modality that we will talk about, there uh, you typically have a wavelength range defined where you expect the peak to appear. Any other peaks are noise or, or contamination. And uh, the setup itself looks like this that uh, you have lamps for uh, different wavelengths of light, then you have a filter, monochromator, beam splitter, and the beam goes, by splitting, it goes into your reference, uh, your reference uh, cuvette, and then the sample cuvette, and then photodiodes capture the uh, outgoing uh, signal or, uh, or light, and uh, then data is uh, collected and processed, or, or the electrical signal is, uh, is uh, filtered, amplified, processed, and so on, and then you get the spectra or the spectral readout. So fluorometry, uh, the system is not very different, although it is different from uh, spectrophotometry, and uh, fluorometry always means labeling the sample, unless if the sample is autofluorescent, so unless it has a fluorescence of its own. But um, what it works with are fluorochromes or fluorophores, which are molecules that absorb light energy from incoming light and emit another wavelength of light. So um, the, this is the so-called Jablonski or Jablonski diagram where um, what we look at, so this is the excitation wavelength. So this is where you communicate extra energy to your fluorophores or fluorochromes and they get excited and into a higher energy state after which the, a relaxation happens and this relaxation happens by uh, releasing or emitting a, a photon at a different wavelength which is the emission wavelength and typically the emission wavelength is higher so there is a spectral shift between the excitation and emission wavelengths and then the energy is released. And um, so the, the energy of your uh, fluorophore fluorochrome is defined by um, uh, Planck's constant speed of light and uh, the, the light wavelength beat. Uh, this is the, the light wavelength of the incident light. And we can relate uh, fluorescent intensity to the lifetime of uh, fluorochromes or fluorophores and tau is the fluorescent lifetime. So again, incident light and, uh, and emitted light. Uh, 
and uh, t would be time which is also quantified in this uh, diagram. The setup looks like this, that uh, you have a light source, mercury bulb, for instance, or can be a laser. And uh, there's an excitation filter. There's a dichroic mirror that uh, only permits a certain wavelength of light to uh, go through and uh, reflects the rest. And there's a lens to focus the, the light which goes into your sample for exciting which is the, the position, here's the position of the fluorophores or fluorochrome so that's the optical plane in which you are working, the focal plane and then from that um, at 90 degrees the light is emitted back the, the emission wavelength uh, light is emitted back and goes through the dichroic mirror, goes through the emission filter and into the optical detector, which would be, it can be as simple as a photodiode or it can be as complex as a photomultiplier tube. Depends on the application and the needs that you have. And uh, if you have not heard about photomultiplier tubes, they are uh, electronic instruments that uh, that can take as little as a few as a five photons and uh, and convert it into a meaningful readable signal. So they uh, capture incident photons and multiply them electronically. So special cases of uh, fluorometry: first, uh, total internal reflection fluorometry or TERF, where only fluorochrome molecules that are very close to the solid fluid interface here are illuminated by the excitation and uh, generate an emission. The other uh, fluorochrome molecules are not involved in the measurement, so you're measuring the, the lower layer closer to the, the solid impedium as glass systems that would be the, the glass slide through which you excite your sample. Then um, this is just your regular uh, good old fluorescence measurement setup with, uh, with a confocal microscope layout where the excitation and emission uh, focal points are shifted compared to each other. So there are two focal points, one for the excitation and another for the emission. And with this you can get additional information about uh, your system and to do this, there is a light source pinhole and uh, there's also a detector pinhole that uh, will allow this to happen. The emission light coming from out of focus uh, fluorochromes is blocked by the detector pinhole. So that's the, the principle for the um, confocal microscope. Amperometry, and now we are not with optical measurements anymore, now we are with uh, electric, electrochemical measurements. And amperometry relies on Faraday's first law of uh, electrolysis, where, um, wherein the amount of uh, chemical change produced by current at an electrode-electrolyte boundary is proportional to the quantity of electricity used. This is what uh, it relies on. And there needs to be uh, a so-called redox reduction oxidation reaction running to provide a background signal, a baseline, and compared to that is the deflection that you measure. And the electrodes are laid out in a way that you have a working electrode, you have uh, an auxiliary or counter electrode, and you have a reference electrode. Working electrode, typically carbon or gold, it's where the uh, oxidation happens. Auxiliary is where the reaction goes in the opposite direction. It can be, for instance, platinum. And the reference would be, uh, for instance, silver, silver uh, chloride. So carbon can also be screen printed. And uh, that, is, that is one cheap uh, production method. And the auxiliary electrode can also be 
a screen printed material it can be silver as well or silver silver uh, chloride as well and this is now done in a flow so in a microfluidic uh, system here's where your sample is here's where reaction happens forward and here's where reaction happens backward and um, you measure or you excite with a current and measure a voltage change or you excite with a, with a voltage and measure the current change uh, in this case um, we talk about the current change so charge over time can be related to the number of molecules inside uh, your solution and uh, yeah for amperometry you apply the voltage to the uh, you apply a potential drop to the working electrode and then you measure the uh, current between the working and the counter electrode so working and counter or auxiliary and uh, amplify compared to the reference um, and yeah this is a, a readout that you get by this so here's a, an impedance spectrum with uh, two different molecules uh, producing a current at different uh, uh, times so compared to uh, to uh, uh, optical measurements where your spectrum is based on um, on wavelengths the distribution here is based on time then uh, potentiometry is similar to amperometry but the electrode impedance is high so there is a minimal uh, current flow and what we measure is charge accumulation on the electrode so we measure the so-called NAMST uh, potential the working electrode potential compared to the standard electrode potential and uh, this one's a number of electrons and uh, the activity of uh, the different uh, reagents um, or they are also called reactants so there's uh, the oxidation reaction and then the reduction reaction and uh, the respective activity of these uh, uh, reactants and products are what you have here and this one is an example where um, the setup is built up as a field effect transistor and the gate is activated so you remember the biosensor needs to have uh, an active surface in this case the gate is the active surface and that's where uh, the binding or the reaction happens and the the reference electrode is placed inside the solution and the source and gate contacts are protected so the gate is what's exposed uh, to the uh, reaction and then you can get a readout like this where you get a potential drop of a few millivolts in response to millimolar concentrations of uh, for instance urea in this uh, example but these all assume a clean solution so noise can be very disruptive for electrochemical measurements and then there's another thing that combines uh, the two modalities of potentiometry and amperometry which is uh, cyclic voltammetry where the working electrode potential is linearly and cyclically ramped in time just like this up and down between for instance uh, minus one and plus one volts or zero to one volt so we're talking about very small potentials and the electrode potential would be um, initial plus sweep rate times the time the concentration can be expressed from Fick's uh, second law where uh, concentration change over time is equals diffusion constant times concentration in space 
or over the electrode area, rather surface area. So yeah, concentration change in this case is related to diffusion onto the electrode surface. And this is what you get, the typical uh, volt tomogram, where you ramp the potential back, uh, forth and back, and then you read the current and you get something like this. And your baseline redox reaction is uh, what, what gives the baseline signal. So you have that, like ferrocyanide, ferricyanide, and then onto that, if there is binding of your target, then there will be a deflection and you will get uh, another uh, nice voltamogram. And then from the deflection, you can calculate the concentration of your uh, target. This is how glucometers work. So impedance spectroscopy, this is a more complicated territory. Um, as an example, for, for this, we talk about tissues, and uh, this one is um, a biological cell in your body, so one cell. Outside of the cell is extracellular fluid, uh, mostly is blood in our body. Inside is the cytosol, which is the, the gelatinous liquid inside the cell. And then we have the cell membrane, uh, which has its own resistance and capacitance. Uh, cell membrane resistance is really high, so uh, that's something to note. And uh, that's, then you can get the equivalent um, circuit for cells. And if we use uh, alternating current excitation, for instance a sinusoidal uh, wave, then the complex impedance will change according to the excitation frequency. Um, and these are just, to recall, um, complex uh, resistance and capacity uh, expressed in terms of angular frequency. And, uh, and this is the complex member. Uh, this is the real, uh, real part, complex part. Um, just probably you have studied about this, but but still anyway, good to have a reminder. Angular frequency is 2 pi f, which uh, where f is the excitation frequency. Uh, so that's what uh, we have to use to express the, the current based on the complex uh, uh, expression of Ohm's law. So impedance is, you know, voltage per current from Ohm's law, uh, that's like this, and then current can be expressed by reorganizing the equation and then expressing the different contributing members, and that's what you get, C being capacity, uh, this being the resistance for an equivalent circuit which consists of uh, resistance and capacitance, that's how it looks. and. What I have here is one equivalent circuit, the Randall's equivalent circuit, which consists of uh, a working and a counter electrode and maximum two reference electrodes. And um, what you can use to visualize the um, impedance magnitude is a Bode or Nyquist uh, plot. And so, an example that you have here has an electrolyte resistance in this equivalent circuit. Electrolyte resistance, uh, double layer capacity, uh, charge transfer resistance, and this uh, Warburg or Warburg element. And some values are provided here for this uh, diagram. So for these values, your Bode plot would look like this. And uh, Here's the um, frequency spectrum and the corresponding uh, impedances from which you can uh, derive also the conductivity of your uh, solution. And at high frequency, the 
the charge transfer resistance dominates at mid to low frequencies charge transfer resistance and uh, sorry at the uh, high frequencies the electrolyte resistance dominates at low to mid frequency the electrolyte resistance and the charge transfer resistance will uh, dominate mechanical sensors uh, first let's talk about piezoelectric sensors so piezoelectric sensors are electromechanical in nature and piezo crystals respond with a mechanical uh, response to an electrical signal also respond with an electrical signal to uh, a mechanical or like an electrical signal to a mechanical excitation and mechanical uh, excitation to an electrical uh, excite or mechanical movement to an electrical excitation that's how they work and uh, so this is what we use so piezoelectric effect means that uh, corresponding to an electrical field you get a deformation corresponding to a deformation you get a change in electric potential um, and this would be strain and uh, linear displacement uh, so strain is uh, rel relative to electric field change and displacement is relative to stress and then d is the piezoelectric coefficient and so you can use piezo crystals for actuation in piezo pumps a piezo crystal is used uh, to actuate the diaphragm that uh, moves the liquid or the membrane that moves the liquid but it can also be used for measurements if um, in this case for instance this is an AFM layout so atomic force microscopy where uh, a cantilever is uh, in contact uh, with the, the surface that you want to measure and that surface is uh, or that sample is moved around on a piezoelectric stage and then the, the vibration frequency of the cantilever is what you record by a laser photodiode uh, setup but uh, piezoelectric sensors can also be used uh, to convert um, mechanical vibrations otherwise to electrical signal that's uh, on a strain gauge for instance that's also something that you can do with uh, such a cantilever setup but uh, we will get to that. So uh, a micro cantilever looks like this, where the beam displacement x is related to the applied force and the beam length l. So l being this length and is just uh, an example of uh, how it vibrates when you bend up and how you how uh, when it is bent down um, the in this case the measurement is done with a strain gauge uh, strain gauge being a piezo resistive conversion of a mechanical signal so the the beam displacement is related to uh, the length, uh, directly proportional to the length, and then this one's uh, Young's modulus, uh, second moment of inertia, and the actuating force, K is the spring constant, so material property. And um, Here's a MEMS implementation of a cantilever sensor. So what you can use to convert the mechanical signal from a cantilever, what I talked about before and what you see here is uh, with a strain gauge where you measure the resistance change of the strain gauge that you have uh, on this uh, cantilever cantilever being a, a micro-machined flexible uh, 
what should I call it, bar that uh, can bend uh, or vibrate in response to molecules collected on it or under it. But, um, in one implementation, you could have this surface activated and then as molecules bind to it, the vibration frequency will change. It will bend down upon uh, load. And so strain gauge is one way to convert. Optical is another way to convert where you relate diffraction to force and piezoelectric is also, you can make the cantilever from a piezo material. That's also a way to con convert uh, the mechanical to, the, to an electrical signal. Uh, a thermocouple is uh, a means to measure a thermal signal. So when we want to measure temperature and it is based on the Zeebeck effect. And I talked to you about this only because uh, uh, Zeebeck is the namesake of uh, the department where I originally come from. Um, he is a, an Estonian German, or he was an Estonian German uh, physicist who worked on, uh, on uh, who discovered, let's say, the uh, thermoelectric principle, which was named the Zebek effect after him, by which the temperature the difference at the junction of dissimilar conductors creates an electric potential difference. So temperature difference, potential difference. The good thing is, that you can also do it the other way. So if you apply a potential difference, you can create a temperature difference. That's what uh, thermoelectric elements use. But uh, here you have this uh, uh, junction of uh, dissimilar metals at uh, where you want to sense the, the temperature. Here's your reference junction kept at uh, reference temperature, typically would be room temperature. And then you have the potential drop that you measure. And this is the so-called Sebeck coefficient, voltage per Kelvin or volts per Kelvin that are defined uh, for the junction types that you can use. And um, to sum up the modalities that we have talked about, for optical measurements, the example I brought you was uh, spectrophotometry, but you can also think about uh, fluorometry they behave uh, similarly to each other, although the setup is uh, somewhat different. What you measure is optical intensity change. Um, the pros are that you have no electrical interference. It is contactless and non-destructive. The cons are that uh, the response is slow and uh, the instrumentation is complex that you need. Uh, in terms of electrical signal, we talked about cyclic voltammetry where a current change uh, appears in response to voltage input and in response to uh, your concentration of your analyte or rather the amount in terms of molecules of your analyte. Um, pros are that it is highly sensitive and compact and relatively simple to make. The cons are that uh, these setups are sensitive to noise. However, cyclic voltammetry takes care of that by uh, target amplification, or uh, sorry, signal amplification, by adding, uh, um, by specifically binding your target uh, from the noisy solution. You can take care of that, but then the response time uh, suffers. So faster response time is achievable with, uh, with uh, uh, impedance spectrometry. Uh, then, in terms of mechanical uh, detection, I talked about cantilever type signals where beam deflection is related to the mass of the analyte that you want to detect. And uh, it's highly sensitive and compact, but on the other side, it's also complex to make and uh, sensitive to, to environmental noise, to, to vibrations. So to sum up, I talked about different types of sensors, electromagnetic, mechanical, chemical, uh, their detection mechanisms and working principles.